Welcome to Meals for Maturity, Bible talks to help you mature as a follower of Jesus, by Pastor Dom Fiocco. Welcome to another Meals for Maturity Bible talk. Sadly, we're way too familiar with the news stories coming out of the Middle East about violence and killings and bombings and, and, and war. It reaches a point of saturation sometimes in our news cycles that we hardly think twice about the next instalment of horror we are given in the news cycles. At the risk of adding more saturation to the news events and the tragedy of murder in the Middle East, let me go back in time to February 25, 1994. This was my first year at Bible College, and this was really the first time I spent any decent time looking and studying the book of Esther. But on February 25, 1994, 29 Palestinians were killed and 125 wounded while worshipping at a mosque in Hebron in Israel. The gunman responsible was an Israeli-American physician, Barak Goldstein. He was apprehended during the attack and then he was beaten to death, but tragically, the death toll was already horrendous. Only hours earlier, Dr. Barak Goldstein was in his synagogue and he was listening to the annual reading of the book of Esther and then celebrating the festival from the book called Purim. It seems he found justification for carrying out his murderous act at the mosque from Esther chapter 9. Fifteen years later, during the annual Jewish festival of Purim again, the Jews were singing a song in praise of Barak Goldstein. Uh, it was a, a line from the song went, Dr. Goldstein, there is none other like you in the world. Dr. Goldstein, we all love you. He aimed at terrorist heads, squeezed the trigger hard and shot bullets and shot and shot. It seems, you see, modern day Jews in Hebron also found justification from Esther chapter 9 for this barbaric act at this mosque on February 25, 1994. Well, today in Esther chapter 9, part 1, I want to explore the very notion of holy war and deal with the violence and retribution we read in this chapter of Esther and work out really if Dr Goldstein and his fellow Jewish supporters singing away, if they are justified in their behaviour. This is going to be a slightly longer Bible talk than normal. I hope that's okay. Now the story of Esther is one fascinating account of the faithfulness and sovereignty of the God of Israel in saving, in rescuing, in preserving his people 480 years before the Lord Jesus enters the scene in, enters the scene in Matthew chapter 1. It's a true story. The story of Esther is a true story set in the Persian Empire, the superpower of the day, where a minority group of Jews have chosen to stay in the city of Susa, even though they're exiled from their homeland of Jerusalem in the land of Judah, even though that is officially over. Now, without going over the story again, the book of Esther is an Old Testament book and one that Jesus and the apostles had in their Bibles. And it's one that reminds us again and again of God's promises to Abraham and to King David, showing us that even though God appears to be hidden, which is a paradox, even though God is not mentioned or referred to across the entire book of Esther, even though the Jewish characters are hardly models of Old Testament faith and godliness, nonetheless, God is behind the scenes, working out his great and glorious plans of salvation, which eventually culminates or finds fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jew born in the line of King David from the tribe of Judah. But if not for the book of Esther and the events we've seen in chapters 6 to 8, if not for the book of Esther, there would be no Messiah, no Christmas, no Easter, no serpent crusher from Genesis 3.15. Indeed, no salvation from our sins or new life given in the glorious gospel of grace. God is the hidden hero across the book of Esther. And perhaps Mordecai, Mordecai realises some of that when he tells Queen Esther, remember in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Esther, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. 
Well, we ended chapter 8 last time looking at these great reversals that come about across the Persian Empire. The irreversible decrees of the Medes and Persians has been reversed. The victims, the, the Jews under Esther and Mordecai are now the victors. The secret of Esther's Jewishness is now out in the open. The one who refused to bow to Haman is now bowed to by all. And the fasting and mourning of the Jews has now turned to feasting and joy. And God's people, at one time about to be destroyed, killed and annihilated, are now safe. And Haman, the enemy of the Jews, has been hung on the gallows that he designed for Mordecai. And as we're about to hear in chapter 9, verse 1, we're actually told the reverse has occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Or if you go to an NIV, it puts it very simply. But now the tables have been turned. See, what's fascinating about that simple line in chapter 9, verse 1, is that here is a passive verb implying that the Jews, led by Esther and Mordecai, did not really reverse or turn the tables at all. It's simply saying that the situation has been reversed and it wasn't about human intervention. Once more, our unseen narrator is telling us about the unseen God at work in turning the tables, in reversing the situation that the Jews across the Persian Empire, including those back in Jerusalem, have experienced. My Bible college lecturer back in 1994, my lecturer Barry Webb, puts it like this. The way the plot is constructed and emphasises that Esther is a story not simply of rescue, but of reversal of the tables turned. Well, let's hear about the tables being turned in Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19, read by Jen, who, of course, loves reading the big list of names in this chapter. Chapter 9. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred, the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men and also killed Parshandatha and Dalphon and Aspatha and Poratha and Adalia and Aradatha and Parmashta and Arasai and Aradai and Baidatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hands on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your wish? It shall be granted you, and what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the 10 sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed seventy-five thousand of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the fourteenth, and rested on the fifteenth day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another.'" 
Well, it's now been 11 months after Haman casts lots to determine the destruction of the Jews across Persia. Remember back to chapter 3. But now, through the hidden, sovereign, providential hand of God, things have now been reversed and God's people, the Jews, can face this former day of destruction with confidence that they can now defend themselves against those who choose to attack them, those who still wish to see the Jews annihilated. You see, the previous destruction day brought about by Haman's hatred has now been reversed to be deliverance day. One Bible commentator cleverly writes, the tables have been turned and the tables are now spread, which is a reference to the celebration to come. In verse 7 to 10, we read of Haman's ten sons, whom I'm not even going to try and pronounce like Jen did so well. We read here that they're also put to death on the gallows of dad, making it clear that what Haman intended to do has now been completely reversed and now his name is blotted out of any future dynasty. You know, Exodus 17, the second book of the Bible, it takes us back to the original problem between the Israelites and the Amalekites. Uh, In Exodus 17, as Moses leads God's people out of slavery from Egypt, the Amalekites came and attacked them. Now, that's not a good move across the Bible story. And so we read in, in Exodus 17, verses 14 to 15, where God says to Moses, Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalekite from under heaven and the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And then as we saw a few studies back, 1 Samuel 15 takes us to another generation of the Amalekites and King Agag And Esther takes us to another generation of the Amalekites and Haman, the Agagite, against Mordecai, the Israelite. And so in Esther chapter 9, we have another example of God actually keeping his promise and their memory is blotted out for what they originally did to his people as they came out of Egypt. Now across chapter 9, we're told about the authorised killings and destroying by the sword held by Jewish people, doing as they pleased against the enemies who attacked them. No longer do the enemies of the Jews have power, but that's been reversed. So Queen Esther and Mordecai's people hold the power. They actually possess the power of life and death over any who continue to hate them and wish to see them wiped out. And in Susa, we read about 500 men being killed by the Jews. On the one day, it was legal to do so by the authority of King Xerxes. And then what seems to be overkill, pardon the pun, by Queen Esther, she asked the king for one more day in Susa to rid the city of her enemies. And so we read a a further 300 are killed, perhaps indicating to us that there are still significant pockets of enmity against God's people here in the city of Esther and Mordecai, and that more time is actually needed to gather and defend themselves. You see, anti-Semitism turns up early in chapter 9. Well, it's still present here by... Early in chapter 2, rather, but it's still present here in chapter 9. Across the empire, we read of a final fatality figure of 75,000 enemies of the Jews being killed, which does sound like a lot of killings, But also keep in mind this is across the vast Persian empire of 127 provinces and lands. And did you hear that repeated line? Three times we heard it in verse 10 and in verse 15 and in verse 16 where we read, The Jews laid no hand on the plunder of their enemies. See, the very thing that brought about King Saul's downfall in 1 Samuel chapter 15, that is, taking plunder from the Amalekites and King Agag, well, now the Jews, even though they are allowed by royal decree, they choose not to take any plunder, that is, goods, riches, property. They choose not to do that from their enemies. They were not to profit from this conflict. The Jews in Esther were not after wealth only their preservation. And so the crisis that started in chapter 3 
has now been totally resolved or reversed in chapter 9, verse 19, where the last enemies of the Jews have been destroyed, at least those who are outwardly displaying hostility towards God's people here in the book of Esther. So chapter 9 ends, and we'll see this next time, with the creation of the establishment of a new Jewish festival called Purim. But let me return now to the problems we face here with the revenge killings or this concept, if you like, of a holy war that we do find across the Old Testament. And what do we do about the barbaric killings and singing surrounding, for example, Dr. Barack Goldstein back in 1994? Well, I can't say everything here about this huge topic, but I do want to give us some food for thought. So I want to give us five points to make you work a little bit harder and in the process, mature uh, in your faith from God's word. So five points. The first thing I want to point out is, importantly, across the story of Esther, we have no reason to believe that the Jews killed the Persians in chapter 9 unprovoked. That is, the royal decree given in chapter 8 and carried out in chapter 9 only allows the Jews to defend themselves against their attackers. So here it becomes, in chapter 9, a matter of self-defence. The Jews do not attack their enemies indiscriminately across this chapter, unlike Dr Goldstein does. It is simply, friends, a misreading of Esther to find justification for killing those who are anti-Semitic today. That is to misrepresent what the Bible is saying. But tragically, it happens far too often and not just with modern-day Jews, but also from Christians. Secondly, across the pages of the Old Testament, there is clear endorsement by God himself, including the command to kill the enemies of God's people from time to time. There is clear approval for what's been called holy war. So across the books of Joshua or Judges, for example, there seems to be genocide carried out by God's people, the wiping out of Canaanites or the Amalekites or the city of Jericho and, and here in Esther chapter 9, the wiping out of the family of Haman and the killing of others, all with God's approval. So what do we do with that? This can be a real stumbling block to people when reading some parts of the Old Testament. Do we just ignore the Old Testament and turn to the New Testament and claim, as some heretics have across church history, claim that, well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament? They say the God in the Old Testament, well, he's a, a warmonger, he's, a, he's capricious, he's a, just a nasty piece of work. But in the New Testament, we meet Jesus who loves everyone and he welcomes all peoples to his family. Well, for a start... That is not a proper reading of the New Testament and not a biblical portrayal of King Jesus, who, remember, across the gospel accounts can be brutal in his judgment against God's enemies. And then across the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, we have a picture of the Lord Jesus actually dressed for battle, dressed for war even, and certainly bringing about death and destruction by the power of his word. So friends, don't buy into the lie that the God of the Bible is two different gods. Now, across both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have the same God who is holy and just and will destroy his enemies, sometimes immediately, others in a delayed form of judgment. And especially in the Old Testament, what we find when holy war turns up, that is when God's people are given permission by God himself to kill others, what we find is that there is always the grand purpose behind these accounts of God's people, that is the Israelites, to not be corrupted by the evil or the wickedness or the idolatry that other nations display. And so God determines the best way for those nations is to be killed and removed from the land and such violence and bloodshed across the Bible is never glamorized as we tend to do in our movies about good versus evil. Israel's military conquest across the Old Testament is much more like a surgeon removing a cancerous growth 
in order that God's people may be spared the sinfulness of these pagan nations. The nations, by the way, who are not innocent in God's sight, they're not sinless, but who are being judged then and there for their idolatry and wickedness and turning away from their creator to worship man-made idols and created things. See, for most of us, we have such a low view, a poor grasp, really, of sin and God's holiness, and so we do struggle with these things. So what we read about, say, in the book of Judges, with the elimination of the Canaanites, is both the judgment of God coming upon them and a necessary action to keep Israel from being further corrupted by their evil. And in the Amalekites, which relates directly to the story of Esther, we have the very first nation across the history of the world who try to destroy the Jewish people. And so the Amalekites, men, women and children, become this paradigm, this representation across the Bible storyline of what it actually means to be the enemies of God's people. And ultimately, holy war across the Bible becomes this picture of God himself warring against sin and evil on the earth, which, by the way, is a far cry from the so-called holy wars that happen across history and even today because of religious bigotry. So fighting in the Middle East, a Jew killing Muslims in a mosque, Christians in the Crusades of the Middle Ages, fighting across religious grounds in Northern Ireland, none of these things should ever be called holy war. And none of these should ever claim God's backing and authority. Third thing, we should never forget the simple Bible lesson, and that is God is God and we are not, and that God is holy and we are not, and that God is just and righteous and perfect in his verdict and judgment and we are not, and that God's purposes however strange and bewildering to us, especially in the holy wars of the Old Testament, God's purposes are always, without fail, good and holy. And only God has the authority to declare a war to be holy. See, holy war declared by God is telling us God is a God of holy love. And your Christian faith should have a good grasp of this truth in Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. And this verse in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And finally, Isaiah 14 verse 24, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. The lesson is God is God and we are not. And we do not see or understand his eternal purposes unless, of course, he reveals them to us. And so in holy war, we do not always see what is truly happening. Fourthly, I told you I'm going to work you hard. Fourthly, we must understand holy war in the Old Testament, in Esther chapter 9, as part of the redemptive history that is unfolding across the pages of the Old Testament. And it culminates in the arrival of God's beloved son, the Lord Jesus you see, in redemptive history, the Old Testament was God's dwelling place in the land. Uh, the Old, Te Old Testament temple was God's dwelling place in the land. And so the temple, that is God's presence with his people, needed to be cleansed because of sin. And so when the Lord Jesus arrives in the New Testament, we have the ending of all holy wars across the Bible and across human history. Why? How does this happen? Well, because the final holy war that takes place, apart from what we read in the book of Revelation, with the second coming of Jesus finally destroying all evil and evildoers, but the final holy war in the New Testament takes place on a hill outside of Jerusalem called Calvary. And here at the cross, 
in the death and resurrection of Jesus. He is taking upon himself all the wages of sin, all the penalty of sin, all the wickedness of sin. And God's holy anger, we read in the New Testament, is satisfied. And in the Easter events, we have then the giving of the Holy Spirit, along with the commands to love our enemies and to pray for peace and to not take revenge. Why? Because the final and true holy war across history has ceased because Jesus has fought its last episode on the cross and it is finished is the cry that ends all holy wars for God's people. We must continue to read our Old Testaments and even the book of Esther through the lens of the cross of Christ. The Bible commentator Karen Jobes helpfully points out uh, it is no accident, she writes, it is no accident of history that the modern nations that still endorse the concept of holy war, so in Arabic, jihad, they are nations that reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and the moral system he commands. You see, in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we see God's judgment and his mercy meet or colliding at the cross. And so there is no more battles to be waged by God's people against human enemies. Fifthly, finally, in saying all this, the New Testament actually points us to see that the followers of the Lord Jesus, you and I, we are now engaged in a holy war, but it looks remarkably different. Famously, Ephesians chapter 6 points out to us that our battle, our war, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, in our holy war now, this side of the cross and the empty tomb, we dress for battle, again, Ephesians 6, with the full armour of God. So when the day of evil comes, we are able to stand firm in the victory won for us by Christ. And now in this, uh, what is perhaps better termed a cross-shaped holy war, we are not called to conquer lands and nations and peoples as in physical warring, but in spiritual warfare. We seek to make disciples of all nations. We pray for them and then we actually do plunder Satan's kingdom with the life-giving message of peace and hope and grace and a fresh start when one turns in repentance from their sins and places their faith and trust in someone greater than the authority given to Esther and Mordecai by a Persian king. Well, there you have it. Lots to take in, I know. But hopefully that helps us understand a little bit better what to do with Esther chapter 9 and our understanding of holy wars that we read about in the Old Testament. Um, well, I hope that helps. Next time, we'll end our series in Esther and we'll study what Purim is all about. Until then, God's peace be upon you in the Lord Jesus Christ.